Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Last Best Hope for Conversation, your Babylon 5 podcast. I am one of your hosts, trying to play chess, which I do very poorly, with Lou. Hello, everyone. And Karen. Hi, everyone. And we are back talking Season 3, Episode 4, Passing Through Gethsemane. Cautious ship arrives at the station bearing a surprise visitor. Lita Alexander returns after visiting the Varlon War. Homeworld, Brother Edward, a monk with Brother Theo, visits with Delenn to discuss their religions. Um, I had said yesterday, last week when we discussed this, this is one of my personal favorite episodes. I hope you guys felt the same way. Let's start out with you, Karen. Quick thoughts about this one. I did like it. Uh Again, there's some PTSD with this one. Uh, Brad Dorif, who, if you don't know him from something, you're not watching TV or movies because he has been everywhere. Um, one of the roles I remember him from, well, number one, he he's the voice of Chucky. So, I mean, if you don't know him from that, then, you know. Um, but he was also in The Exorcist 3 where he was the Gemini killer killing people whose names start with K. And I watched this when I was quite young <laughs> and that he was killing people with the name of K. One of them being a Karen kind of made freaked me out when I was little and I had like nightmares about it and stuff. So anytime I see him in something, that's the role that I go to in my head. And uh, he seems to play that kind of role often uh, in that movie. Well, okay, I'll go into it later, but I'm just supposed to give you my impression here, which I'm such a rambler. Um, I'm so sorry. But yeah, I, I liked it. I had that bit of recognition from Brad Dorif, and it's nice to see the monks again. Um, I, I feel like this is a an episode that's in the arc but it's also a one-off which is kind of weird but yeah super super interesting it is interesting to see it doesn't feel like a one-off it feels like it's part of the arc but at the same time it's hard to point exactly what lou what do you think it definitely feels like a one-off to me i mean the only stitching in this episode oh so the episode that goes with the series is the final scene with uh, Lita and uh, Kosh. But uh, like Karen said, Brad Dorff, I remember him all the way back when one flew over the cuckoo's nest. He's, uh, you know, he's amazing in that. Billy Bibbit, I remember him from that. And then, of course, uh, personal favorite of mine that probably most people haven't seen is um, Graveyard Shift, based on a Stephen King story about rats in a mill. Excellent. And then, of course, Lord of the Rings, the Alien series. He's even been on Star Trek. Uh, yeah, just an amazing character actor. And I thought uh, at first I thought, uh, boy, they're he's playing a really nice guy in this episode. He's really going against type. But no, they still had to bring in the the evil Brad at the uh, in the back half of the episode. So, uh, yeah, it was a uh, uh, a really good episode and it felt like a real twilight zone episode to me as well and i really liked it i got one or two things i didn't like but overall uh, a very strong episode mostly because of brad Dorff's acting abilities yeah we have talked about over the past couple episodes that it feels like they've been able to notch up their casting game a little um and this is this episode is an example of both. Yeah, um, exactly. They notch it up in, with him, but they notched it down with uh, one of the other character guest stars. Yeah. Um, so I love the um, the idea that he's, you know, one of the really sweet scenes, I think, is Brother Edward talking to Delenn 
and Lanier about their belief systems and wanting to know this. And um, the idea that they aren't being uh, evangelist, they're not trying to convert anyone, they honestly want to know, tell me about your beliefs, tell me what that, and a wonderful discussion about, like, the the flashlight pushing against the wall, and the light is, you know, is it the source, but that's what we see, and there is a, a nice little point about, uh, they make a little comment about Valen, which uh, flash is something that will be important later. Um, so let's start with what your thoughts are, and we'll specifically about his discussion about religion and the idea of him sharing that night that if you ever went to Sunday school, you talked about uh, often that the night before he was crucified, Jesus is in the garden and asks uh, his father to take, let it pass me. So uh, Lou, we'll start with you. Just kind of this overall, the religious theme of this episode. Yeah, I, I was uh, surprised that the episode really went that deeply into the, you know, the philosophical, theological uh, discussion, but I, I quite enjoyed it. And it illuminated more of the Membari belief system, which is good because we don't know too uh too much about them we know some but the concept of souls not being uh, uh physically or connected to the to the body entirely is a concept that we've uh, gotten before because they've obviously found out or believe that some human souls are minbari souls so uh, if they uh if the body is just a receptacle for the soul then that really ties into their whole thing about humans having minbari souls so uh, i i found that discussion uh, interesting and a very interesting character beat for Brad Dorf's character because it sets up his whole dilemma in the back half of the episode and it's obviously by design but i i just thought it was a you know it's not a a point of that I think a lot of people would make about the what the what a religion means to them, like especially Christianity, about the you know uh, Jesus decide, trying to decide whether or not to go through with uh, what's going to happen to him the next day. That's not something that I've heard other people bring up very often. So it, it was an interesting discussion point, and I was hoping that the Minbari were going to react to that in some way beyond just sort of like nodding or smiling but that's uh that was a little bit disappointing but uh because it obviously seemed to make an impact on them but uh they didn't really go any further beyond that point so that that was a little disappointing but yeah i i just set the whole discussion you know what about um what makes a person a person and you know beyond their memories versus their soul that whole discussion uh, as well was interesting um and it's something that i you know is is one of those un unanswered questions that people talk about all the time so it, it it's uh it's a nature versus nurture sort of discussion as well so i i, I really liked like that and i was really at that point in the episode i was really curious as to where they were going to go with that and what where they went with it was really interesting yeah agreed um i also think that this is one of those episodes that if you want to you can just watch it and it's a good piece of sci-fi but there's also things that you can think about you know you take home something to think about to discuss to uh ruminate on just you know, deeper topics and more than just, you know, um, the soul issue, um, which, yeah, you're right. It's been brought up before. And I think that's the big plant in this episode is the whole soul conversation um, is, you know, what, what goes on with souls in Babylon five. And I think that's a big, 
part of, you know, this is the arc in this episode. And um, there's that, but there's also the concept of forgiveness. There's the concept of, you know, can people change? Uh, there's just a lot of things that are deeper in this episode that, you know, if you take it to a deeper level, there's things to think about, which I really like um, theology. And and I I also find it interesting that this episode comes when um, Sinclair is not the commander. Sinclair, who is a Jesuit, uh, and we know he holds beliefs dear. Whereas Sheridan has even mentioned on this, I'm not much for religion. So it's a completely different vibe with him. You know, he he doesn't have to have that mindset where forgiveness is key. You know, he he because he has no religious beliefs. He can look at this and not be biased by that. So there's a lot of different things here. Um, I think Edward, uh, when he starts remembering things, I think he becomes tortured. And not just because he was a bad person, but because these are traumatic memories. So, I mean, there's just so much involved in this storyline. Um, all of the crew was brought into it. And uh, it really makes for a, a huge amount of depth in this one episode. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I love when um, Brother Edward is saying, you know, when and obviously we'll kind of go into this where. Um, they've outlawed capital punishment, but they've done the capital punishment of the mind. Um, by the way, the um, JMS in the script book mentions that Garibaldi's reaction to the um, how there should be not an execution chair, but an execution bench was pulled directly from Jerry Doyle's. They said they would get heated at the lunch table political discussions, especially um, in, by the way, after Babylon 5, he ended up being in a very um, similar to Rush Limbaugh type of talk show host, right? Not, you know, very, you know, political to the right. Um, the idea, right, that we don't kill anyone. What we do is we destroy your personality and we give you a chance to serve others. Um, and that's what had happened with um, Brother Theo, I'm sorry, Brother Edward, where he had been this um, serial killer. And he now has no memory of that. And I loved the idea, once he knows that there may be this other life, his plea to, how can God forgive me? if I don't even remember the sins I've done and brother Theo saying, but he knows what you've done and he knows your sincerity. I thought it was a very mature um, grown up discussion of faith and doing that um, was really touched by that discussion. Um, so let's go through, just take it wherever you want, Karen, um, you know, people are up unhappy that he didn't die. They wanted kept, you know, <clears throat> I remember once I had a real good friend. He talks about the difference between punishment and revenge and that that's why you don't have victim. You know, there are surviving family members of victims involved because they want revenge, not justice. Uh, so they're wanting justice and it isn't enough. So they go and bring it upon themselves. So Karen, just anywhere you want to go with this storyline, let's go with it. And Lou, you don't have to wait for her to finish. Let's, we can go back and forth if we have some thoughts. Okay. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, Malcolm, who the actor looks normal in other roles, just so you know, but in this, he was super creepy. Uh, the eyes were getting me in this episode, but, and he plays like a cowboy all the time. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting, but yeah, 
I don't, if, if I was, God forbid, the family of a victim of a violent crime, I honestly don't know where I would fall in that range. I feel like I might be on the side of Malcolm sometimes, uh, where, you know, going to jail isn't enough for some people. But, and why should we feed them three times a day and and let them walk around on the earth when my relative is not? Uh, so yeah, I I uh, I have very mixed feelings about that. I feel like I was kind of on the side of Garibaldi and and even though he is later on in the episode, he is you know more set apart he has to you know play both sides of the fence at the beginning he he makes no bones about it that he thinks that the capital punishment should be back he he doesn't believe that this, this mind wipe is enough i did love the lens uh, so you want to end up where everyone is blind and toothless mm -hmm. <laughs> and he said just the guilty ones which right. also is but who are us to decide which are just the guilty ones, right? It, yep. That's the downside. But go ahead, Karen. Yeah, well, sometimes you know, right? I mean, this guy, apparently, we knew that he had committed this crime. There was not two bones about it. Uh, so, yeah, I can see where Malcolm wanted to have his revenge. And it was a pretty smart way to do it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that this is well known that you can hire someone to reverse it sometimes or so getting into the whole mechanics of it. I find this interesting. It tells us more about how this works, the death of personality, which again, I think that might be another lamppost, the death of personality thing. Um, but again, that's kind of tied into the whole soul situation mm -hmm. i think uh i'm assuming you're you're nodding lou so i'm yep. assuming yep. yeah sorry for the non-video listening audience no that's all right <laughs> um yeah. I, I feel like this is the path that we're on right now that we're learning quite a bit about humans and to that extent also minbari because we know that they're tied together somehow we don't know exactly how yet because of you know Sinclair and what has been implied um and I'm sorry I'm getting off on tangents in this episode no it's I, I, good I think that conversation between Mal not Malcolm um Edward and Delenn and, and uh Lanier was really illuminating and that the whole part of this episode that deals with souls uh redemption mm -hmm. justice revenge uh i think that all goes together all of it uh the the side of the theology of it and then the side of you know the secular uh and what they believe in and i also feel like uh the the way that they came full circle with Malcolm getting mind wiped as well was interesting and i i have a serious question for you guys uh, uh brother theo he knew obviously that Malcolm had been mind wiped so he played it off like he didn't know that Edward was mind wiped when he went to uh, Sheridan and talked mm, to him. Interesting. I, I have to take him at his word. I mean, especially as a monk, he, why would he lie right. about that? But yeah, I feel like he might have known. Just there was something Perhaps. in this. I think maybe after the fact, like he tells the story that was burned, there was done. He he joined the order, and um, because I think when he says. Then when Brother Edwards is saying, you know, I there's these memories and Theo goes, then it's best not to pursue them. I think, you know, he's aware. 
Um, I do want you specifically, Karen, and then you, Lou, to talk about that end where we get the twist that the murderer now has mind wiped, has joined mind wiped, has joined the order specifically at Brother Theo's request, and how Sheridan didn't want to. Re- I mean, he was angry. I thought Bruce Boxleiter played that perfectly. Like this person killed someone I liked and admired. And and he is guilty of doing not killing someone, but the same anger that these other people had. And Brother Theo reminds him, weren't we just talking about forgiveness? So go ahead and Karen, talk a little about that. And then, Lou, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I thought they set that up nicely where uh, Brother Theo and uh, Sheridan were discussing things, you know, after their chess match and Brother Edward was there. And he, Edward shows Sheridan the little giraffe figurine. I don't know what it is. Technically, yeah. it was far away. Had a, yeah. yeah, whatever <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, it was unfinished. So I couldn't tell if right. it was like going to be a, it was going to be some kind of animal. Yes. Right. The Rorschach uh, test. Right. Yes, exactly. It's a, it's a tchotchke <laughs> of some sort. Yeah. Um, and that he promises it. To Sheridan. Sheridan says he'd be honored. And then, you know, near the end, he actually gets that piece of art uh, from Brother Theo. And then he is challenged right there. What are you going to do about this? I know you don't believe in all this, but here's Malcolm. We're taking him under our wing because... He, he has shown he needs to serve, you know, and it's all this coming full circle moment. And there was a lot of meaning in that little scene there. You know, does does Sheridan go off the rails? Because we've seen him go rogue before. Uh, I, again, if I were Sheridan, I've, I'd have a really hard time, especially when it was it was perpetrated against someone I cared about. So yeah, it was difficult for me to take sides in that moment. You know, I thought he would have been maybe a little justified in, in going after Malcolm. I I mean, he did it already. He was going to take out Malcolm and they had to hold him back. So. Okay. Lou. Well, that scene and the preceding ones are, uh, were my biggest issues with the episode. Um, the the scene with Sheridan uh, with B- Brother Malcolm. I have two reasons why I, I have problems with that one. Um, but the preceding scene where they capture Malcolm, I just thought that the actor overplayed that scene and it killed it for me. I mean, his look was enough. He had like the straggly hair and like Carol said, the uh, the crazy eyes. He didn't need to be. You know, like that for me, it's always that that spinal tap 11 thing. And I know it's a subjective thing, but I just find understate, understated stuff works so much better. Like, you know, I the best example for me is in the Silence of the Lambs, you have the build up to Hannibal the Lecter. You know, you're going to see this crazy kind of monster. And then Jodie Foster walks down the hallway and there's Bruce, there's, um, Oh God, what's his name? I can't believe I can't remember his name. Well, the actor playing Hannibal Lecter, but he's just standing there like a like a butler. Like, you know, that's mm-hmm. to me is so much more effective than the histrionics yes. that the the character actor did in the in the uh the actor did in the the scene there when they they capture him. And uh for the Sheridan scene with Brother Malcolm, I th- didn't like his reaction. I don't believe that he would be that revulsed. I mean, he, from for all we know, because this is a guest star, this is the first time they've had a scene together at the beginning of the episode. So for him to react so, so negatively, I just thought was, again, over the top. Uh, and I also think that he would be sympathetic to that person's uh, position as well, because Edward uh, killed some relative of his. We don't know what the relationship was, but so I, I just didn't like his reaction. And I, I know they were setting it up for that, for the forgiveness moment, but I, I didn't like, I didn't like that scene. 
uh, or the way that scene was played uh, for myself. And the other problem I have with that scene is because of the great setup that they had with Garibaldi in the beginning with the Lynn talking about this whole thing, he should have been the one that should have had that scene, not Sheridan. To me, that payoff, we never got to see what Garibaldi's final uh, uh, thoughts were on this. Like, had he, did this episode, did this incident change his mind about the whole mind wiping thing? We didn't get an answer to that. I mean, he's kind of, we can sort of see because of what's going on with the torture of uh, Edward and that, that it looks like he's kind of rethinking his position, but it's never explored. And I th I think this episode would have been much more powerful if that final scene had been with Garibaldi instead of Sheridan. So, uh, yeah, so I, I've got conflicting feelings about that. I, I, I can't agree. Like Jesse, you said he played that perfectly. He, from the perspective of, doing what he was probably asked to do. Uh, yeah, I think he did a good job, but I just think he was asked to do it the wrong way. I mean, well, I shouldn't say it, it was not the wrong way. It was just in a way that I didn't like. So, uh, yeah, so I I, I thought this episode <clears throat> really missed, uh, that, that was a real missed opportunity not to have Garibaldi in that scene. And uh, it's too bad. And also even a scene with him and Delin again afterwards, because Delin and, and Lenier never had a chance to, you know, reflect on what had happened with Edward as well. And the whole, then the whole question about Edward and his mindset, where did that come from? Did he have that before his mind wipe or did the mind wipe set it up that he would, you know, pose such a question to himself whether he would have the courage to face his accusers um or captors and i yeah there was just some missed opportunities there for for more exploration of the whole soul versus personality memories and whatnot and uh so th that part of the episode i was a little i was disappointed with so but because there's some great questions and I just thought they missed the opportunity for some great payoffs. Yeah. Karen, you want to give your thoughts? Yeah. The, you mentioned Garibaldi at the end, and I never even thought of it. But boy, would that have made a great scene if mm -hmm. Garibaldi was there with Father Theo and Malcolm comes in. Yeah. Uh, that would have been amazing. I do feel like we know where Delenn stands on that issue. She is all for forgiveness and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, but I, I would have liked to see them, Garibaldi and Delenn, have another conversation. That's true. But I, I overwhelmingly think that would have been a great scene now that you bring it up. I mean, I never <laughs> thought of it, but that, that would have been amazing. The minute you said it, I thought, well, that would have been the right way to go. So yeah, I get it. And that dude. Uh, yeah, I, I do agree that the guest star, I I don't agree with his, the way he chose to perform this. I think, to go back to your point, being understated would have made him more scary. Instead, he had that, you know, wild hair in his eyes. Yeah. And, and again, know, I, I, we, we don't know if he was told to play it that way which exactly. i assume he yes. was so I, right. I can't give him the blame but no. usually when they're doing scenes like that they usually like well in movies they have more time obviously but in, in yeah. a tv show you're tight but usually they, they will play a scene and the actor will give several different flavors of the how to respond yes. to that i just don't know if there was an understated version of it but i think sometimes um tv creators maybe especially back I think it's less of a problem now, but but I think back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, they sometimes didn't give the audience enough credit for right. uh, uh, cap understanding what they were going for in a particular scene. And some, so they sometimes overplay it to really get their point across. And I think this is one of those instances that where that happens, which is unfortunate, but uh yeah, and I mean, some people will probably like that scene, but for me, I'm I'm always much more of the understated kind of kind of approach yeah. to those yeah, kind of scenes. Me too, and I do think that he made Brad Dourif look sane, 
And that yeah. is a difficult <laughs> thing to do because yeah. Brad Dorf always looks a little unhinged. Yeah, in exactly. Whatever he's in. And this dude, Robert Keith, who played Malcolm. Wow. I agree. Um, I would could have done with a less of a frenzied performance with him for sure. It, it really would have had more impact if he wasn't like he was incredibly unhinged, that dude. Yeah. And. I think Babylon 5 does a better job than most in uh, playing the subtle and letting the audience fill in the, you know, the spaces. Mm -hmm. But I agree with this. This was a little too much on like, OK, yeah, we had to do this. Um, <laughs> one of the things that um, I think I think my guess is Garibaldi would not have changed his mind whatsoever. And that's why they didn't have, have him coming back because he would have been like, good, you know, um, you know, I, in fact, we should kill this other guy, you know, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I don't know. That's just my side. Um, I love the idea that it, it is easy to be the golden rule do unto others as uh, you would have others do unto you mm -hmm. till it gets specific and yeah, until it becomes love, personal yeah, yeah and then it's you know well i want to forgive everyone but not this guy right mm -hmm. right like yep. that guy that i need an exception on this yep. and the idea of was um i did love and obviously this is a show but um I remember the first time I watched it and when I watched it, I watched it again a couple of times is the idea him setting up with Delin when they ask, what is your, what is that one moment of your faith? Right. And he talks about being at the garden and he having that person, would I be able to wait? Would I be able to know what people are coming for me? Would I be able to, um, take it even though i know it's coming and then i i found it very sad yet at the same time kind of beautiful that as he's dying he said i i was able to do it i was i i did know what was coming and i did meet it and uh and i was you can tell me now i'm getting verklimp of um theo forgiving him you know kind of giving that uh, absolution was just really beautiful. And I'm sure that someone uh, not knowing Stravinsky would go, wow, you know, well, obviously he, he may be a lapsed Catholic, but he's a Catholic. And, uh, you know, Joe has said that he believes, while he is an atheist, he thinks that it should be treated with respect and mm -hmm. you can write it well. And I thought that scene was really beautiful when he's sending him off to in their mind to a, you know a, the the next plane and just really beautifully done any thoughts on that yeah, uh, I, yeah I agree with I, you i think you've okay. got that pretty well covered i i do okay. want to push back though on the garibaldi point that you made i do think okay. he would have at least had some doubts and that conversation if he had that conversation with lynn like I would just, just so so. How do you feel now about what you th you said to, yeah. before about mind wipes or something like you know whatever? Yeah, but nope. but uh, I agree. Yeah, and I mean, I if he doesn't change, then that would be kind of disappointing. And drama shows are about characters changing, so I would mm -hmm. be disappointed. And he would have to have a good reason. If he had maybe if he had had some tragedy in his life backstory or yeah. somebody he loved that was killed, like where. You know, I don't know if his attitude is because of his job or because of something that happened to him personally. Um, so mm -hmm. that would have been interesting to find out as well. Yeah. Um, so we get a connection to this storyline that a um, Centauri telepath was being used to help manipulate him. Uh, we get the you know, brother Edward is thinks he's going crazy because he sees things on the wall. Then he doesn't see some things on the wall. And it just conveniently works out that we have an unlicensed uh, telepath hanging around 
you know, she went for a little vacation in the Verlon War. I'm not allowed to tell you anything about it, but let me tell you, it was cool. Okay, if I could spin show you my slides from my vacation on the Verlon <laughs> Homeworld, you would love it. Um, and I am curious, especially because Lou, um, and Patricia, if you're listening, to this skip ahead. You were you have not been as in love with Patricia Tallman's performance as much as others. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see what you think about Lita's uh, return and specifically um, her discussion with Londo when Londo threatens her and she comes back and brings the threats to another level. Let's go with you, Lou, and then you, Karen. Yeah, I, I think that that. This was her best performance to date, and I don't know if it's because they found a lane for her character to operate in where her range of acting works the best, but I, I actually found her threat to Londo pretty chilling. So I, I thought she played that scene really well, and that was that's the best acting I've seen from her to date. So whether or not that's going to continue, I don't know, but it's interesting now that that transformation came about <laughs> and maybe because now she's got something to hold on to 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 work against because now she's i we don't know if in that particular scene whether or not kosh was in her or not uh, my assumption is that he was but i have no way of validating that and i think that Something happened for her character in this episode uh, behind the scenes that gave her something. Like, I, I don't know what her her character Bible was when she was working on the show before. But something happened in this episode that she stepped up her game. And maybe it was just her new hairstyle. I don't know. I, I liked her hairstyle. With, I'm going into Karen's, Karen's lane <laughs> here on that. But I thought that was the best haircut she's had in the show so far as well. So that helped <laughs> and that's pretty shallow right but uh hey, yeah i i just thought that's part of her character yeah i i just thought that she uh yeah i i just found that whatever lane she's in right now it was wor working really well for her though i do have to push back or i i'm a little annoyed with the oh i'd I, if i told you i'd have to kill you kind of storyline i just hate that like yeah i've been there and if she had been there and the word of this gets out, people are going to come after her. And, uh, you know, whether it's the Earth government or the PSYCOR or whoever, they're not going to find out, well, what, you know, exactly what did she find or see experience when she was there? So that that kind of annoyed me. I, I hate that kind of storytelling, especially like, you know, when people are talking about relationships and they always say it's complicated. I just hate, 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 hate that because that's a cheap cop out um, withholding information from the audience just for the sake of withholding it because you don't want them to know something at, right at this moment. Like, why did she even have to say that she had been there? She would just say that I was rescued and they, they brought me back. Like, I, I don't understand that particular aspect of that storyline but that's that's not a thing that's you know just specific to Babylon 5 it's it happens in so many shows and it still happens today and it's the more dramatic storytelling you watch the more annoying that kind of writing gets to be so yeah so short but sweet yeah she was good in this episode agreed uh the, I I also feel like this was a, a turning point for her character in more ways than one. I think uh, Patricia Tallman did a much better job uh, in the meat of her character, I think kind of showed in this episode, uh, which is good. Uh, it's nice to have a telepath on the show that doesn't have to live by the psych guidelines. Uh, and, there is a part, this is where I have an issue mm. with the episode. Gosh, gosh darn it. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is not the word I used when I when I talked about Kosh. They're withholding so much information that I feel like I want to know. And they're also not really, I feel like they're feeding it to us in tiny, tiny little bites instead of 
something I can chew. Uh, I, yeah, there are holes in her story. She did say this was going to be a home base for her, but that she'll be away a lot of the time. So maybe that's the way she's going to try and evade Thicor coming after her is to be gone most of the time. Uh, and I'm assuming that means Kosh will go some of that time uh, because now we know there's some kind of symbiotic thing happening between them. Was that coming out of Kosh and going into her? Was it coming out of her and going into Kosh? It was hard to tell. Um, we do know that she now has gills and most of the episode, they sh when they showed her neck, there were no gills. So what was going on there? Uh, and I, I know she's wearing a collar, but there is a scene in particular where she doesn't. Uh, and to me, I was like, what, why are we not seeing at least something there? Like her neck's a little bigger or something, but it wasn't. I didn't uh, catch that at all. <laughs> yeah. I specifically, because I've, you know, this is my third or fourth time. I specifically was watching mm -hmm. the scene. Um, and also, right. The, they established that Franklin did a full workup and he's talking about all the changes like, oh, you're you have higher blood oxygen and, mm -hmm. you know, these scars are now gone and uh, you're. But you have gills, which, yeah, again, but, I mean, why didn't, didn't you notice that? Right. Yeah, and so, uh, you know. I'm with Franklin. I didn't notice it either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but that's just it. There's they're only they only come out, I guess, when. Uh, Kosh and her are doing whatever they're doing. Um, it is a very eerie scene where you you aren't sure is he putting stuff in her? Is she putting stuff into him? Yeah, that let's not get too eyes, deep into that. Yes, right? yes indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I yeah. thought it was him leaving her body, but mm -hmm. that, oh, that's how okay. I took that's it. A, and, that's an interesting theory. Yeah, because he obviously is using her to interact with people on, on a on a level that he can't do when he's in in his natural form and so now we know that he's a non-corporeal being he doesn't have a physical body he seems to be made of energy of some sort and maybe he's a soul maybe he's just a soul i don't know <laughs> yeah see i think that that might be where that ties in to yeah this episode yeah. and what I, I feel really to bad. I totally missed that gills thing. <laughs> was that in the scene oh, yeah, where she, she's transferring? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, have to watch. Like I was so gills. like dazzled by the lights, but that I yeah. didn't even look at her neck. So Pretty I was light like, squirrel. Yeah. Uh, light squirrel. Yeah, she's got three on either side of oh, her neck. Okay. Wow. That's um, odd. Yeah. So you know, I have so many questions about that, and it makes me insane. Uh <laughs> The whole Kosh thing. I mean, you guys have, have heard my whole thing with Kosh uh, over the last just, couple of seasons. Yeah, so. I just treat him like Gandalf. Like, you don't really ever yeah, you know kinda, exactly. Yeah. But he's there when you need him to do something. That, hand wave, hand wave kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. yeah. I guess. I, I just, you know, I can see something bigger. I can see that he's going to play an important part. And it bugs me that I don't know as much about him as I do Delenn, who is going to play also a very large uh, part in this coming bit. Uh, and I, I still want to know, is he a good guy or a bad guy? This makes him seem kind of foreboding. What What is going on with this? You know, why are they being evasive about what she saw, what she's doing with Kosh? What, so, yeah, there's, I mean, I feel like they, like Lou said, She's told everyone she's been to the Vorlon homeworld, right? right? It's it's common knowledge right now that she's been there and back. Why does she say that, though, if there's something going on that's sinister under the radar, whatever? I mean, why does she let that out? Why do, doesn't she have a cover story for that instead? So, yeah, I'm... That, that's an interesting point, Karen, that. that you mentioned that because she only told it to like the, the inner group, right? Um, you know, Sheridan, Garibaldi, Susan, and Franklin. So how did that conversation get outside of that room? That's very interesting. Unless she um, told someone else. 
And then, when we don't yeah, see it. Yeah. But and, she doesn't seem like the kind of person to just do that kind of <laughs> freely free discussion. But but Londo found out somehow. So to me, that indicates that there's some something something's not uh, something smells rotten in the leak? state of Denmark. Yeah, there's yeah. a leak. Could be. Whether it's her or Kosh or yeah, yeah and, who knows? But I wonder um also could the people in the CNC see that the Vorlon ship is coming back and then you see leader around, maybe you put one and one together. I don't know. Uh, a lot of reasons. I, um, once again, I do think Londo is being very Londo ish. First, I'll try to bribe you with a lot of money. Now then I'm going to blackmail you. And I love her getting in his face and going, you know, if that happened, you would have the worst nightmare ever uh, was really neat. <laughs> um, I, I think talk about overplaying um, the scene of where they put the uh, Centauri telepath, you know, they put a bag over his head and then she's like, remember, remember, you know, I think that was played a little bit overly dramatic. If I was nitpicking. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Although, yeah. I mean, if she has to get by some kind of block. Right. And again, that's putting more stuff in my head. Mm -hmm. Is she going to sense a block in Susan? It, you know, there's all this other sort of connotation that comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, and so. it was good to get confirmation that Centauri's do have telepaths. Because I think we've talked about yes. this before, that we've never really had confirmation one way or the other. And now we do. Right. And it would be well, interesting to see how the Psychor handle or interact with uh, telepaths from other races as well. Yeah, because I know when that young girl, they offered her to go to Centauri, right? Yeah. So, But this is the first time we've seen. Um, I We do have a somewhat famous name directing this episode, and you had mentioned that last week Lou. Oh, yes. what did you think uh how did you think he did Adam Nimoy yes that's right I forgot all about that uh thanks for bringing that back up um yeah I mean it, it, there was nothing too showy in this episode it was pretty pretty you know pretty workmanlike um I I thought that there were some Nothing really stands out to me, though, except maybe the shot when they find uh, Brother Edward in the uh, that room where he's sort of like crucified. Crucified. Yes. I thought that shot was pretty effective, but beyond that, no, it was it was all pretty straightforward, pretty workmanlike. Uh, you know, it, it didn't call attention to itself, which I guess is what what the, you want from uh, from your director when you're doing a weekly TV series that fit well within the, the themes and moods of the show. So yeah, it was, it was okay. I, I wouldn't have known it was his, I don't know. I haven't seen enough of the episodes that he's directed that to know whether he has a certain style, but nothing really jumped out at me. So you did mention that this felt like a twilight zone episode a little bit. Yes. And Adam Nimoy directed quite uh what at least one episode of the Twilight Zone that starred his father. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So but for yeah. me that that reference was more of this the 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 central theme of the episode. That's a very I could see Rod Serling say, What is a man? Is it his memories? Yeah. Is it his soul? Yep. Yeah. He, I, I'm brother Edward. I'm look, yeah, I'm looking <laughs> at his IMDB page and he has done a lot of one or two episodes of series um yeah. things from like party of five three episodes of party of five the gilmore girls uh the practice ally mcdeal um nypd blue murder one uh he's done two episodes of babylon five um i just looked to see what was the other one he does it's a good one um so yeah and he's married to the wonderful terry farrell which good for him that's yay i'm <laughs> i've always had a massive crush on her so good good for him um is there anything else we should cover on this episode okay i have a question for you sure and it might not be anything but um why where is marcus 
I, I want my eye candy. Um, I think so, as usual, right, that they, because it's 22 episodes and they're trying to save money, that you can't have all the cast on one. So he's out doing Ranger stuff. Mm. Okay. Yeah, there is no mysterious. Uh, we get plenty of Marcus uh, later in the uh, season. Okay, good. Because yes. I want him back again. Hello. Please. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Bruce is enough eye candy. I I'm not yes, going to complain about that. that. Yeah. But he yeah. wasn't in this episode very much. So mm -hmm. I wanted mm -hmm. some Marcus. Yeah. I I'm just curious now why Kosh's ship always goes to Bay 13. Is there, is there something about that number that we're supposed to Ooh. take from mm. it? I don't know, but it's an unlucky number in human culture. So mm -hmm. does it mean something different for different races? That's something... Mm -hmm. um, and I'm I'm curious to see where the monks are going to be, what their role they're going to be playing. Um, I like Brother Ed or Brother Ted. I always want to say Father Ted because of that British, yeah, Theo, yeah, Theo yeah. The Father yeah. Ted, that a British show. Yeah, um, that's a good show, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, uh, yeah, it, I'm interested to see how the monks are going to play out. The, the monks and bad habits. Um, and I'm. Just, Curious to see if this thing with Londo trying to find out about the Vorlon homeworld is going to go any further as well. So we'll have to see. That was a fun give and take where Londo says, lead Alexandria as I live and breathe. And she says, I suggest you, Rouge, remove your hand, <laughs> Ambassador, or you won't be doing either for very long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, um, I'm a big uh, Lita fan, so I'm glad to have her back. Um, I did love the beginning with the uh, the chess and uh, Brother Edward and Susan back and forth while they're playing and uh, kind of in a foreshadow. Gambling is one of the lesser sins. I always thought if you're going to sin, you may as well go for one of the really big ones. Right. Uh, Which very, he very, did. Yes, yes he yeah. did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I wonder if Brother Malcolm's going to come back. That would be interesting. It would be, yes. Um, okay. I uh, No other thoughts? We'll get to ratings. Okay. All right. So, Karen, how about you're up first? Okay. I'm going to give it uh, eight and a half chess pieces. Okay. Nice. Lou? I will we'll give it the same score, and then I'll make it eight and a half fried synapses. Ah, nice. Um, I'm going to give it a little bit higher just because I love uh, Brad Dorf's performance. I mm -hmm. love um, Brother Edward and Brother Theo's scenes together. Um, I, I think they're really, really something special. So I'm going to give it nine out of ten unfinished, unfinished uh carvings yeah okay. so very good yeah very yeah. nice so th th there was one thing that yeah. they, i did find effective that they did with the uh, brad dorf is when he was having those flashback scenes but when they made his hair wet and they would have it like dangling in front of his eyes i thought that was yeah. a nice visual to show that he was agitated and uh sweaty you know, and yeah yeah i thought that was a nice yeah. touch off kilter good. very yep. nice yeah all right uh karen do you have our very um, wonderfully uh, insightful and consistent emailer. Yes, I have the email from Texas Anna Shock, and I shall read that for you now. So, did you take one look at Brother Edward and decide this would be a horror story or something akin to it? What's our answer? Yes, I said. Yes. I knew he couldn't be all good, at least. I had a book years ago, The Unofficial Guide to Babylon 5, where the author said of this episode that JMS takes us by the hand and leads us step by step to some place we don't want to be. <laughs> That's pretty funny. In the process, he leads us through an episode full of imagery and symbolism that I just love. The conversation between Theo and Edward set up like a confession booth. The scene of him waiting in his own garden of Gethsemane and being killed on a cross for the sins of Charles Dexter. As has been mentioned before, JMS does not believe in any religious tradition, but he does handle it with a great deal of finesse. 
He doesn't treat it like it's complete hogwash because it isn't to the characters. To them, it's real, and he gives it the seriousness it deserves. And at this point, I wound up with an entire block of text rambling about the death of personality, the current penalties for murder, the problems with them, and whether or not mind wiping is an actual improvement. It was a long one. Suffice it to say, they do have problems, but any alternative to them will have problems of their own. Oh, and Lita's back. Like she just went to the corner store, but did she remember the milk? Anyway, I'll see you next time. Hope you like surprises. This is the Texas Anlashock signing off in Valen's name. Wow. Yes, always. I really, really love their emails and um i love the little tease because they know what's coming up next they kind of you know give you this little morsel uh thoughts and that's uh, just wrong <laughs> although it's a good thing i don't read their email until now yeah because then i don't have to wait a week yes <laughs> to watch the next episode i can watch it today yeah uh lou um you're going to tell us in a minute how people can find us on YouTube, but mm-hmm. any uh, insights? Uh, I know there's a there is a continuing discussion about the episodes when we post these on YouTube. Anything specific that there were questions they asked or something we need to cover? Um, not really. Just some comments about, um, and this was for uh, a day in the strife. Uh, somebody remarked that Garibaldi has his own ad- addiction issues, so uh, he can relate to Franklin on that level as well. So I, I, I think that's a good point. Um, and uh, somebody else mentions that the Sh- Sheridan is going to have to win the Shadow War with words. He can't win it with superior firepower. So, yeah. yeah. So I appreciate all the all the, the uh, posts there, people, and keep them coming. Very nice. All right. And if someone wants to... Uh, hear the episodes on YouTube where they can find it where? They can find it on YouTube at Lou's Reviews and uh, you'll find our Babylon 5 podcast there as well as our Stephen King writers, our JKL Media podcast and uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lou W. Sitzma and at S. King Podcast. All right. And Karen? I am at Elevaria on Twitter Machine and other places and my blog is alliesstuff.com. And I am at Jesse Jackson DFW on Twitter. Um, I am really proud uh, this week, this past week, I put out an episode where I talked to the writer Warren Zanes about his new book, uh, Out of Nowhere, The Making of Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska. Um, I'm pretty proud of that interview. I felt like we went to a few places where Warren's been doing a lot of press for this book. The book is amazing to cover um, why Bruce decided to go from commercial success of The River and their first top 10 hit, Hungry Heart, to Nebraska, which had no singles, really. no He did no press. He did no touring. And then the next step to Born in the USA, where he hit the atmosphere and blew up and became quote unquote Bruce Springsteen. So it's a very great book. And uh, we spent about an hour together, Warren and I discussing his fandom. And I'm there. I'm always proud of all my episodes, but this one I'm especially proud. I felt like we went some places that is worth exploring. So I hope everyone will go check out that episode. All right. Um, where, where can they find you though? Oh, um, at um, the set lusting Bruce wherever you can find a podcast, uh, whether it's iTunes, Good Pods, YouTube. There's actually the interview with Warren is on YouTube. If you look uh, Set Lessing Bruce on YouTube, there there's actually a video of he and I discussing this because um, I don't always put up all my podcast on video, but I did with his. Um, and so please let us know what you're thinking. And how can they email us like Texas Amleshock? Can oh, I set you up anymore? Yes. Um, <laughs> we are available at send us an email to jklb5podcast at gmail.com. I will tell you that our Gmail inbox has been looking a little lonely. Uh, Texas, agreed. 
Texas Alashock is the only person emailing us. That is amazing. Don't be intimidated by their great emails. We take them all with love that next week when we are talking uh, the episode Voices of Authority, that if we got two or three uh, more feedback. So that would be great. Agreed. Yeah. Um, yes, we are going to talk Voices of Authority. Sheridan has an interesting time dealing with the new political officer stationed by EarthGov. Ivanova and Marcus take the White Star in search of the first ones. So there you go. Ask and ye shall receive, Karen. More kosh. No, no, no. It says Marcus and Ivanova take oh, the White Marcus. Star. Marcus Yay. and Ivana would take the White Star. Yay. So yeah, we've got uh we've got a a, a road trip. Will it lead awesome. to romance? Who knows? Mm. All right. For now, uh I just want to say this is my birthday weekend. Uh as we're recording this, it's June 4th. I turned 64 yesterday on June 3rd. My 39th wedding anniversary was Friday, June 2nd. And I cannot think of a better way to bring this anniversary birthday weekend to close than spending time with two of my favorite people, Karen and Lou. Wow. Um, this is such a lovely, lovely. Um, I, I'm so glad we get to do this every week. Mm -hmm. And so Fancy. thank you both for that blessing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, listeners, go out there. Uh, watch Babylon 5. Send us emails. Be kind, be safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye. And see you.